Hey there, everybody. This is Corey Huff with TheAbundantArtist.com, and today is our Game Changer discussion with Melissa Dinwiddie. Uh, say, say hi to everybody, Melissa. Hey, everybody. It's Melissa Dinwiddie from Living a Creative Life. Um, I, I am very excited to talk to Melissa about this. It's been, gosh, almost a year since we had this conversation um, that, that we like to have from time to time about how to build a life as a creative person, as an artist, as a musician, as a, a creative being. <laughs> um, so, so we're going to, Melissa and I are going to have a little conversation about uh, her art career and her art life. And um, we're going to ask that you, you know, if you have questions, feel free to, to drop those in the comment section. Uh, we're definitely going to get to your questions, uh, but it might be towards the end. Um, we'll be monitoring those, but, uh, you know, we might just wait till the end to get to your questions. There's some really good stuff in here. Uh, Melissa has been a professional creative for uh, quite some time. Uh, you're not that old, Melissa, but... You know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm older than you. <laughs> uh, a little bit, a little bit. But Melissa's been, Melissa's been a professional creative for quite some time, and, and she's, you know, she's, she's been there, and she has some great stuff to say. So for those of you that are listening who are just getting started on the path towards becoming a professional creative or those who are really struggling in your creative life right now, uh, I think Melissa's going to have some great stuff uh, to share with you. So Melissa, without further ado, uh, for those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about your background as an artist and how you make your money. Okay, well, um, I actually didn't become an artist until I was almost 30, Corey, which is probably not that much. You're probably about that age, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm 33. Okay, so I was barely younger than you. Uh, I, I loved making art as a kid, but I got really stuck in a, a fixed mindset when I was um, pretty young that other people were the artists, not me, and I really completely stopped making art in my teens. I got into dance in high school and I was really serious about that and that was my career path for a few years until I got injured while I was a student at the Juilliard School. And then cut to several years later, I discovered calligraphy in my late 20s, I think it was 28, and I fell madly in love with it and I gradually, little by little, turned that passion into a business. Uh, I did a lot of private art commissions, poems and quotations, a lot of marriage documents, occasional logo design, a little bit of graphic design. Um, and early on in this little tiny career that I was building, I made my very first ketubah, or Jewish marriage contract. This is a document that's a traditional part of every Jewish wedding ceremony. So it's a niche market because pretty much everybody who has a Jewish wedding gets a ketubah. Although I've also created similar documents for non-Jewish couples as well. Mm -hmm. So that uh, became obvious to me that, oh, this Ketubah thing, this, this seems like something that, that sort of, um, there's, there's money there. There's not like enormous money, but there's sort of steady money. So I, I kind of followed the money, right? And I, it's not that I made a killing, but um, I realized that there was this persistent demand so that became my main focus, and I made dozens of ketubot, that's the plural of ketubah, dozens of ketubot by hand on commission, and then in 2001, I created my very first print, because I realized that if I started offering prints, it would expand my market, because I could sell them for a lot less money than I could, you know, afford to sell an original for, and it would also add some a little bit of automation, a little more stable cash flow, and at this point I have a line of about about two dozen prints, which I customize for each couple with their names and their wedding dates and stuff like that. But uh, honestly, working to client specifications all the time is one of the things that completely burned me out on my art business and what eventually led me to start my blog living a creative life in 2010 I was really pretty unhappy here I was making my living from my art but I was only doing work for other people and for a long time I was also really stuck in what I like to call perfectionist paralysis I had you know been making my living from my art and that put a lot of pressure on it right so I became really frozen by fear that anything that I created for me, for fun, 
wasn't going to be good enough. And I really had to develop tools to get back to creating for myself, to feed my, feed my soul. And I realized that I needed to treat art like I was a little kid playing in a sandbox, right? Mm -hmm. Which that led me to create some rules or, or guidelines for myself, which I now call my keys to creative flow. I used to call them my 10 rules for the creative sandbox. But nobody likes rules. Nobody likes rules, right? And nobody <laughs> likes to feel boxed in. So I changed it to uh, keys to creative flow. And I have found these to be pretty foolproof to creative flow, not just for me, but for m more than a thousand other people at this point. And now I'm on a mission to empower other people to feed their own creative hungers, and that's become its own small business. So I still make a good chunk of my income from my art, my Ketuba sales, but I also get use my creativity to get other people creating through online courses, in-person retreats and workshops, one-on-one -on -one coaching, small group coaching. And the really cool thing, Corey, is that as I let myself kind of muck about in the creative sandbox, making messes just for fun and focusing on the process and not on the product, I, I started sharing pictures of my process online on Instagram, which shoots them out also to Facebook and Twitter. And people have been asking to buy my paintings that I've just been making for me, right? So I feel like I've kind of come full circle from, from this, well, I don't know if full circle is the right metaphor, but starting from this place of I'm not an artist to being a professional artist making my living to being a completely burned out artist and now to a really joyful artist again. Mm -hmm. And I and I've you know I've known you for oh my gosh, I've known you for like five years now. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh and it's really cool to see what you're talking about, right? Like we met when you were sort of in that trough yeah. Uh, yeah. of of <laughs> I'm totally burned out and I don't want to do this anymore. Um, you know, I remember uh going on a long walk and having a, a phone conversation with you um when you were sort of at your low point. And, and you were walking. I remember yeah, that phone call. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and it's so cool now because I, like these art sparks that you put out. Like for the longest time, it was just this art that you made for yourself, and you didn't like. Sometimes you shared it with people. Sometimes you didn't. And um, and then you you know you went to the Design Your Life camp or whatever it was, and you decided to start sharing this these deeply personal pieces with people. And I've seen this happen over and over and over again with artists, uh, the pieces that matter to you as an artist, they matter a lot to the people that see them because yes. we can't help but respond when somebody puts their self into their art. Exactly. Totally. Yeah. yeah. At Design Your Life Camp, I was blown away by how my pieces were practically flying off the shelves. Uh, the mm -hmm. They weren't really shelves, but flying off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... So where do you think along the way people started to value your work as art? Um, uh, well, I think other people valued my work as art a lot longer than, before than I did. I mean, way mm -hmm. more bef earlier than I did. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this starts with your this starts with your your calligraphy and ketuba work, right? Like people started asking oh, yeah. you to pay you for it, pay you for it before that. Yeah. So right after I got interested in calligraphy and was thinking, gosh, I'd kind of like to turn this into a business somehow. I didn't really know how. A couple of friends commissioned me. I mean, it was really for pennies at the time, but it was money, right? Real money. They commissioned me to, to create some pieces for them. And, uh, you know, it, it, it took me a couple of years, really, to call myself an artist. But it's so funny because I, I did really dive into it the classes that I was taking, the art classes and calligraphy classes, with the intention of forming a little hobby business, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, within the first few months, some of the paper cuts that I created, that was one of the first things that I, that I used to do, uh, got accepted into some art shows, and then I got some boom, 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 three articles in the local press over the next few months, and I kind of took that as a sign from the universe that I was headed in the right direction. <laughs> So yeah, and I, I just started taking any kind of any kind of work that I could that would pay me anything. And I learned a lot of, you know, kind of like the school of hard knocks. I learned <laughs> I learned the hard way what I didn't like to do and that, oh my goodness, undercharging really sucks and <laughs> and, and you know, learned to wise up about that over the years. Yeah. You know, it's so fun to have this conversation with you. Um 
so many years after the fact and sort of look back on it with wisdom and experience, right? Because <laughs> um, <laughs> when you're in it, it's it's uh, it, it's frustrating and 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 uh, it makes your heart race, you know, and and like getting that first commission or those first few commissions, you get so excited about it, and then <laughs> and then you and and you're at, in this high, and then you realize that you can't possibly make a living at the rate that you're charging, and so then you crash into this low. And um, I remember you when you first started doing the Katuba work, you, you mentioned that there was a commission for like <laughs> you, you for like 700 bucks and you were like, yes, 700 bucks. But then it was like 70 hours worth of work. And so you were making like 10 bucks an hour. Um, yes. It's so, so true. So how <laughs> so did you, true. yeah. Um, how did you decide that you, how did you decide that you were worth more mm. than that? How did you, mm. how did you justify the raised rates? Um, yeah, that, that is a really great question. So really at first, I mean, I didn't know when I accepted this $700 commission, which was more than I'd ever made for anything in my life. I didn't know it was going to take me 70 hours, but it literally did. And mm -hmm. at the time I thought, oh, $10 an hour. Yeah. My previous job had been a nursery school teacher years before at eight fifty an hour or something. So that was, it was improvement, right? Mm -hmm. But um, pretty soon what happened was I found myself wanting to quit. Mm -hmm. I was feeling really resentful of these lovely, lovely clients who were commissioning me to do artwork for them, and I just felt like I wasn't getting enough payoff for it. And thankfully, I realized that I didn't actually have to quit. I just needed to charge more. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's been a really important gauge for me ever since. If I'm ever feeling resentful of the work, that is a clear sign that I'm not charging enough. What do you think that is? What do you? What, why do you think that there's such a clear correlation between being paid more and and feeling like you, you know? Well, what what is it mm. that creates that sense of value? Do you have any thoughts there? Well, I mean, it's just as a as a person who's doing the work, you're you know you're laboring away, blood, sweat, and tears are going into something, and somebody's paying you a fraction of the time and effort and expertise that's going into something, it's just like that just feels so wrong. <laughs> and I, what I learned about resentment over the years is that it's really not anger at somebody else. It's really anger at yourself misdirected at somebody else through the lens of victimhood. Because you haven't drawn a line. You haven't set a clear boundary and so I hadn't set clear enough boundaries of no I need to get I need to get compensated more for my work and it's still it's an ongoing issue I think pricing is one of the hardest things that we that we deal with and I think now that if I'm not if I don't have a little bit of discomfort like oh my gosh am I charging too much then I'm probably charging too little and it definitely if I'm feeling resentful at all that's it price has to go up yeah yeah um, I think that's, I, I really like what you said there about uh, resentment being misdirected anger, um, you know, that it's really anger, anger at yourself for not being willing to stand up and, 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 yep. and, and be where you need to be. Exactly. So I know that uh, the, the, the business part of you really kicked in after your first marriage falling apart. Yes. <laughs> um, tell me about, tell, tell, tell people about that. Well, um, when I got divorced in 99, I, I wasn't earning even close to a living wage because I didn't have to. My husband made enough to support both of us. So I had this little business and it had grown very organically. I was completely clueless about marketing and business. Um, and really, I only made enough to pay for my classes and conferences I went to and my art supplies and stuff. And suddenly... I had to figure out how to make a living. And I had a moment of thinking that maybe I should just go, you know, get a job. And I, I remember this moment, I looked through the classified ads in the local paper and I realized that I did not have enough experience in anything <laughs> to get more than an entry level position. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably I could have if I'd figured out how to have a little bit of confidence about it. But at the time, I just couldn't envision it. And I, I, just, I just knew that I could grow my business to make more than, you know, some kind of entry-level, low-paid job. So mm -hmm. I just gritted my teeth, and I determined 
to make it work. And I had two and a half years of partial spousal support, and that filled in the gaps. But then after that, I was flying solo. I didn't, I didn't have any outside help. So I just, um, yeah, I knocked myself out to make this, make this business sustainable. <laughs> and I love that. I love that you decided that it had to happen, so then you went and figured out how to make it happen. Um, you yeah. know, I, I know that you took courses and you partnered with people and you did all kinds of things. You did all the things that were necessary and some things that weren't necessary to, to, <laughs> to make the business happen. Um, and a lot of artists, uh, you know, they, they want to get to that point. They want to get to the point where their art business is self-sustaining. But you had an interesting experience that I... I've actually seen a lot of artists go through at this point. You know, when you and I first started doing this a few years ago, it was wasn't something that I had seen too much. But now I, I know that it is a very common pattern that you had painted yourself into a corner, no pun intended, <laughs> uh, and you couldn't afford to keep doing the art that you were doing. What does that mean? Yeah. So uh, what happened was I kept adding new designs to my line of Ketuba prints. Uh, but the prints themselves, that, they weren't enough to pay all of my bills. So I kept taking on commissions as they would come along. You know, you never know when a commission's going to come along, and it was impossible to say no, right? So creating each one of these prints was just an enormous amount of work. And as I added to my line, I got more orders, which is great. But then I had to fill the orders, so that added to my workload too. Mm -hmm. But because I wasn't making enough from the print sales alone yet, I couldn't, I just couldn't turn away any custom work. So I ended up essentially working extreme overtime for several months at a time for years. <laughs> it was really, really bad. I would never have wished that on my worst enemy. My mantra for a number of years was, oh, I wish I could just stop, I wish I could afford to stop taking commissions. Mm -hmm. And when I finally realized that, oh my goodness, I've, I have built up enough of a, of a line of prints that I can afford to stop taking commissions, it occurred to me, I had kind of a, kind of a, a pivotal moment when I realized that if I didn't stop taking commissions, I was literally going to drive myself to an early grave. Mm -hmm. And, you know, honestly, here I was making money from my art, okay money, and I was really miserable, and I, <laughs> I was not... A thriving artist, I was not living an abundant life. Yeah. I, I know that some artists really thrive on doing commission work uh, because they enjoy that thing. Uh, but a lot of artists don't. Uh, you know, and, and there's there's that dealing with clients and dealing with people who are unhappy and handling payments <laughs> and, and all of that stuff. You know, there's there's lots of ways to make a living as an artist, but I'm glad that you were able to figure out what worked for you. And that's sort of the, the sort of the essence of what you and I have been working on the last couple of years together. Yeah. Um, so so what happens when art becomes just a job? What happens when you reach that point where it's not fun anymore? Yeah, that that's exactly that it, art was just a job for me at that point, which was so sad. Because of course I started making art because I loved creating with my hands and exploring and experimenting and learning, but when I had to rely on my art to pay my bills, I focused more and more just on what's going to bring in the money. And I stopped playing. And the only creating I did after a while was when I was making something for a client. And that has its own rewards. I'm, I'm actually really glad that I had those years of doing custom work and it forced me to do things that I never would have done on my own that I'm really proud of and I learned a lot. But it's a really different animal from creating just to feed your own soul. And I, whether an artist chooses to be a designer, to, to you know, be a hired paintbrush or a hired pen, I, I, it's so, so important to make sure that you're always still making space and time to create for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then, then when I retired from taking commissions, I, I built up this business selling and reselling prints of the pieces that I'd already made. And uh, I kind of had this story in my head that um, I didn't have time to make art anymore because I was so busy filling all, all of these orders. But there was the fact that, uh, well, on top of that, that my, um, my drafting table and my studio began to feel like all business. 
no play, no fun. So sitting down to my drafting table didn't feel like a fun thing to do anymore. It kind of felt like a busman's holiday, right? <laughs> so I don't think that this is necessarily what has to happen, but it's what happened to me, and, and it's just so important that you make sure that your art, you know, your true passion never becomes just a job. You really need to keep space to create just for yourself. Yeah, and and I think it's important to point out that we're not saying that you need to always be pursuing your passion, but instead just, you know, you're building up a business as an artist and, and a, you're creating a business that brings in money for you, but it's important not to let that overshadow the reason you became an artist in the first place. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so how, if you were going to look back at the way you started your business, um, how would you have built that from the ground up to prevent that kind of experience? For those who are listening and thinking, but I really want to be an artist. Yeah, so how, yeah. do I, how do I not have how do I not have that experience? What well, anybody who's who's starting out now has a huge advantage over me in that it's 2014 instead of mm -hmm. 1995. <laughs> there are just so many more resources available. So if I were starting right now, I would look for people with experience and expertise that I could learn from. If there had been a class available, like now, nowadays, there are things you know available online to teach the basics. I would have jumped on that. Mm -hmm. And I also would do a, a regular gut check to make sure that the business that I'm building isn't just built around what I can do well, mm -hmm. but is also built around what I truly love and adore doing. So like right now, I know that I no longer have any interest in doing the kinds of commissions that I used to do in the past where I'm creating a piece you know very much art directed by the client but I'm very happy to accept commissions from people who like my style want to own a Melissa Dinwiddie original and understand that that means I have 100 percent artistic control yeah, so that's like a, I that's would a pretty set big that up shift the for start. a lot of artists yeah yes a huge shift for yeah a lot of people yeah so how does how has that worked out for you? How has following your vision as an artist worked out for your business? Well, one of the most interesting things is that th well, uh, there were a few years where I fantasized a lot about selling my Katuba business because I was so burned out by it. But when I finally started getting back, getting back to feeding my creative hungers, I actually started enjoying the work again. And that alone, I mean, even just 15 minutes a day in the, playing in the creative sandbox made a huge difference. Um, and it's funny because now I kind of think of my Ketuba business as my day job, mm -hmm. <laughs> even though it grew out of my exploring my desire to create. Um, the other creative stuff I do, all the paintings behind me and stuff, th those are things I do for me. And even when I do it with the intention of earning an income from it, I work really hard to keep my intention of having fun and nourishing my creative spirit. I, I really work to keep that front and center. And I, I should also note that I have, I have a lot of friends who have 9 to 5 jobs, but they've talked about that same feeling of abundance because they're doing their creative thing, even though it isn't their job, the way that mine became for me. So I'm a big proponent of people just whether even if you have no interest in making a living from it, do your creative thing because it's just going to make your life so much better. Yeah, I would 100% agree with that. Uh, I think everybody can benefit from doing something creative, uh, you know, on a regular basis. Um, do you think that a lot of artists are trained to set their goals low? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the answer to that, I mean, obvious to you and I, the, the answer to that is yes. But maybe you can talk a little bit about why we think that and how yeah. that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I got divorced in 1999, I remember setting a goal of how much money I wanted to make. And it was really, really my mantra was I just want to make enough to get by. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I made just enough to get by and not a penny more. 
And I, I think of it now as having a glass ceiling over my head, mm-hmm. but instead of like you know working at an employer, employ, working for an employer and not being able to move to the next level or whatever because of sexism, this is a self-installed glass ceiling. This is this is a glass ceiling that I installed myself because of a limited belief system. And honestly, I think a lot of it is simply that I really didn't have any models of artists making real money. I I didn't want to believe the starving artist myth, but there there just wasn't much that I could see to counter it, right? And then on top of that, of course, there's a lot of internalized sexism that works against women. Um, I, I, you know, I can't speak to your experience as a man, but that that's a big thing of just feeling like, oh, you know, I don't want to take up too much space in the world, right? I can't, or I can't possibly, I'm not, you know, smart enough or good enough, which is ridiculous. Of course I am. Um, but then also there's this fear of business and marketing, which is really common as creative types. Mm-hmm. I really thought my whole life, I thought it was something I had no interest in. And I also kind of believed that knowing how to make money was something that you had to be born with rather than something you can learn. You know, I thought that I just wasn't in that line when they were handing out you know, the ability to make money before you get born, right? You know, yeah. it's differently that we can all learn these things. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much. Uh, that Those last few sentences that you that you talked about there, I think there's so much about that that goes right to the core of why, as a culture, people think that artists are relegated to uh, poverty or to uh, sort of a, a, a less abundant lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, sexism, fear, uh, lack of role models. You know, yeah. uh, I think the lack of role models thing for myself was a big one. You know, oh, yeah. right? Um, you talked about setting uh, your financial goals low. Uh, I remember when I was in college, I was working for a guy who was a serial entrepreneur. And he asked me how much money I wanted to make, and I told him it'd be great if I could make thirty thousand dollars, because I, because <laughs> I had no idea, no concept of what was possible, right? Um, and I didn't know, you know, that you could have a lot more, and uh, that's something that I think I'm really enjoying working with you on helping people overcome that. Yeah, and also that you you can have more, and and having more doesn't mean that you're a greedy person. Mm-hmm. Or that there, yeah. or that you're bad in any way. The more resources we have at our disposal, the more good we can impact. You know, the the more we can impact the world in a positive way. Yeah. So let me ask you this: What boundaries do you have in your art? What, what do you say no to? And how do you think other artists can learn to set their boundaries? What? How does that work? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Great question. Uh, I think the the most important boundary that I've learned mostly <laughs> is not to set my pricing based on fear. I have done that more times than I can count. Oh my god, I'm not going to make my mortgage payment or whatever. I need to lower my price in order to try and draw, you know, get make this sale or whatever. And mm-hmm. every 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 single time I've ever done that, I have kicked myself. It is always 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 a mistake. Yeah. And, and yet I still get pulled to do that, but at least now I know it's a mistake. <laughs> uh, I've also set a lot of boundaries around who I'll work with, what kind of work I'll do. For example, um, I, I really don't do custom work so much anymore, but when I was doing a lot of custom work, I f- did come to the conclusion that if, a, if I was doing a custom piece for a client or a client came to me looking for that, and it was something that was so specific to them that I couldn't reproduce it and sell it to other clients as a print, then I either wouldn't take the job or it would be dramatically more expensive. Um, and then if a, if a project doesn't interest me, I just won't take the job. And then also, after working with hundreds of clients at this point, I've developed a pretty good kind of radar of who's going to be a pain in the butt. And... <laughs> And, you, know, you have a painful client radar. Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, as one of my ex-boyfriends used to say, some money is too expensive. Oh, some, great. you know, yeah. some jobs are just not worth it. Uh, and then the other thing that I want to stress that I really can't stress enough is the importance of having a written agreement. Mm. So if you're working with a client, 
Um, you just, you know, contract is sort of a scary word, but you need to have in writing, even if it's just an email, what you are going to deliver and, you know, the timeline and what they expect and how much they're going to pay. So you each know what the expectations are from each other because our memories are flawed, right? And I have almost been burned uh, a number of times, and it was only thanks to having it in writing that I wasn't completely taken to the cleaners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's amazing, like, I'm sort of imagining all of the uh, young artists that are listening to this uh, and sort of curiously scribbling notes. Uh, <laughs> how in the, I, I can't imagine, like, there's nowhere out there really to learn this kind of stuff other than just finding someone like as someone like you to teach it to them. Yeah. Um, I feel like I, I sort of like I'm getting a little emotional thinking about how are they how are we gonna teach them? How are we gonna reach them? Ah! Um, I kind of stress out about it. So so after all of this you learned some some pretty tough lessons and I know that uh, you told this story a number of times, but your art career almost fell apart in, in two thousand eight. Uh, that was around the financial crisis uh, in the United yes. States. What happened? Ah, oh, boy. I mean, it's something I can, now I can look back on with a sense of humor about it, but it was so, so scary and awful. Um, so my bit, my Ketuba business is so wedding related, it hadn't really ever been affected by the economy much before because people are always going to spend money on a wedding, even when times are tight. They just spend mm -hmm. a little bit less, right? And my income without me knowing anything about business or marketing, my income just kind of grew steadily every year. From when I started in, I filed my first DBA, um, fictitious business name, in 1996, and it just little by little, every year, it just grew, 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 until 2007 it was my best year yet, and I was on track. The next year was going to hit my big target income number, but the next year was 2008, <laughs> and the economy crashed, and my business totally tanked mm -hmm. and partly I had fallen behind the times um, when I got really burned out and I stopped taking commissions my intention was to sort of coast for a year and just not do anything new for my business because I had been so working so hard and I needed a break I totally get um, that yeah but then <laughs> That turned into two and a half years, and all kinds of changes happened online, and I didn't keep up with any of it. And then on top of that, the Ketuba business just kept getting more and more competitive, as you know, tons of new people were entering the the quote unquote industry because thanks to the digital revolution and all of the improvements in high end low cost printers, you don't have to be a calligrapher anymore. You don't even have to be an artist. You <laughs> <laughs> just all you need is a printer, right? <laughs> so not only are you competing with all of the other skilled artists out there, but you're also competing with all of the people who yeah. are not artists. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. And well, I mean, it's a lot like what happened when um, digital, uh, what's it called, um, desktop publishing mm -hmm. entered the scene, and anybody could be a graphic designer, right? They didn't have to have any eye for design. They just needed to print a computer. And the same thing it was is true now for Ketuba artists. So there are tons of people now doing the same thing that I'm doing but charging a fifth, a sixth, whatever of what I am for a personalized print which is a lot of labor involved. And so when I realized what was happening I just completely panicked and because I didn't know anything about how to run a business and make good decisions I just threw a bunch of money at the problem as they say and I got really seriously in debt uh, which I'm still paying off and crossing fingers, this this will be the year that I pay it off. Nice. Um, and I was so tempted to chuck the whole thing. I, it was really not a good... That, and that's when we first encountered each other. <laughs> so, so you spent a lot of money on stuff that, that didn't help. Uh, what did you learn from, from that experience? You're, you know, you're still paying it off, but what did you learn from it? <laughs> yeah, well, the first thing I learned, unfortunately too late, is never, never, never spend money that you do not have on marketing. Never, never, never spend money you do not have on marketing. Marketing is always, always, always a gamble, and do not gamble with credit. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a very expensive lesson that I learned. Um, and I also learned that I need to be a lot more careful about where my business funds go. So, you know, I tried some really pie-in-the-sky things, 
I kept thinking, well, this is going to be the silver bullet that's going to solve my problems, but none of my decisions was well researched, and none of them were silver bullets. It was very stupid. Uh, so now I spend money to educate myself to become a better marketer, but I spend very little on marketing per se. So that's interesting. Um... You said that you, you spend money to educate yourself to become a better marketer, but you don't spend a lot on marketing per se. What's the difference, and why is education worth more than advertising? Well, advertising, and that's whether you know whether it's uh, you know Google ads or Facebook ads or wherever else you'd buy advertising, or mm -hmm. like art fairs, wedding fairs, which I also did or um, PR, worked with a PR firm, all that stuff is always going to be a gamble. Mm -hmm. It's a big gamble. And if you, if you educate yourself well on how to do it before you spend the money on it, then it could be worth trying out if you have a big reserve of cash to play with. But it's still a gamble. But education, that is an investment that is going to pay off. The more you can educate yourself, on how to run an effective business and market it well, the less you're going to need to rely on gambles, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so this situation that you found yourself in where you had spent all your money uh, and you were getting frustrated with doing custom work, it puts you in an interesting situation where you blew your cool with a, with a bride. Um, and, and she, <laughs> my understanding is that this was a fairly large commission. Uh, so, so one, why did you blow, lose your cool? And two, what did you learn? From <laughs> so this is like the, my most embarrassing moment probably in my entire life. Um, I, I was, it, it was also like the lowest moment in my life. Uh, I literally did not know where the money was going to come from to pay my next month's mortgage. And I was in such a state of panic. Um, as the worst feeling when money is that tight. And I had been starting to do some research online about marketing and all the sort of gurus who were out there seemed to, to say that it was really important to create a sense of urgency in order to close the deal, right? And I was so desperate to close this deal right now because my mortgage was coming due um, that I, I completely lost sight of the fact that this was a human being that I was talking to. And this was a couple that I had been in correspondence with for weeks. They had been going, going back and forth with me, asking a zillion questions. And she had said that she was finally ready to place the order. And so I called her up. I was so excited. But then she seemed to waffle. She wanted to consult with her fiancé. And because I was so panicked <laughs> in this flash of stupidity, I... I offered her an additional premium bonus service upgrade, something or other, yada yada, if she uh, didn't sound this cheesy, but if she placed the order right now. <laughs> and that, that was just so stupid because, you know, if I had kept my cool, she would have called me, probably called me back the very next night or the next day, and she would, she was on, she was ready to order not just one Ketuba, but two a Ketubah and then a Quaker wedding certificate, plus she wanted to get invitations. So this would have more than paid my mortgage. But instead, um, you know, I totally scared her away. And I don't blame her. I would have been scared away too if it had been the situation had been reversed. Yeah. Those, those buy now tactics are not as effective as the marketing gurus would have you believe. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, boy, I sure learned that. <laughs> <laughs> the hard way. So Melissa, um, you know we're we're getting short on time here. What is what is your dream? That might seem like an abrupt change of uh, change <laughs> of uh, subject, but I think that well, just, just tell me about the dream that you have. Okay, cool. Well, um, the the thing that makes me smile is that I have to say that I'm I'm really living my dream in many ways. I mean, of course, my goals keep getting bigger. You know, I reach a goal, and then I go after the next goal. But, but basically, for me, the foundation of my happiness rests on two pillars. One is following my creative callings, expressing myself creatively. And the other one is empowering other people to do the same thing. And I do that every single day. I, I do still have lots of big goals, however. I want to pay down that debt. 
mm-hmm. completely paid off. Um, I'd like to make a bigger impact and help and inspire more people. Uh, I'd love to publish a book. Uh, I'd I'd love to record more CDs and do more performing. Uh, we didn't talk about the fact that I'm also a singer songwriter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd love to do more teaching. I've taught I co-taught a creativity workshop in Istanbul uh, about a year ago, and uh, want to do more of that kind of thing. I want to make more paintings. So I've lo- lots lots of smaller dreams inside that that bigger dream, but the underlying dream is is really already in place, and that. I gotta say, is really the the greatest feeling in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what happened? That we talked a lot about your business. What happened to your personal life when you started following your dream and living your creative life more authentically? Mm. Well, it's interesting because um, my personal life and my business life are <laughs> so intertwined, you know. But, but really, everything started getting so much better. Excuse me, I was just so much happier. And, you know, when you're happy, it, it gives you the mental and physical space to, to make space for things that are important to you. So, you know, like friends and family, I, I could make more space for them, which in turn made me happier. And I, I really believe that following your core dreams is really the key to everything. Yeah. And what happened to your business when you started following your dream? Well, the interesting thing is the more I've put my energy on the things that I'm truly passionate about rather than just what I'm good at or what I think mm-hmm. I should do or what I think would make me more money, mm-hmm. uh, the more things have started to fall into place. So I'm enjoying my business so much more and um, you know, it's, it's, it's growing instead of shrinking, which is a wonderful thing, and I'm just enjoying life so much more. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Melissa, um, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with us and to talk with me and ha- let everybody else listen. And um, for those of you who are listening now, uh, if you're on the artempowers.com slash live page, uh, I would love to have you leave comments if you have questions. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you can leave comments on the YouTube channel and ask questions there. Uh, and if you are on Google+, Plus, you can hunt us down, uh, either with myself or Melissa, and ask us questions there on, on, on either of those pages. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to let us know. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll wrap up. But if people have questions about Melissa's art career or how they can sort of get started, any of that kind of stuff, in the few minutes that we have left, um, I'd love to to talk with a few of you. I know that there's a, a bunch of you listening because I can see how many people are watching the video. <laughs> <sighs> we'll give people a minute to finish typing their questions. The other thing I should say, Melissa, is um, you know, while we're waiting for people to type their questions, uh, we are going to be doing website reviews um, for people who are uh, who, who want to have us take a look at their artist website and, and evaluate where they're at in their art career and give them some advice for going forward. Um, that's going to be an option. If you are on the Art Empowers uh, waiting list, uh, you can just go to artempowers.me and uh, you can get on the waiting list and we're going to send out uh, instructions on how to uh, submit your website for us to review it. Um, so that'll be one way you can have us take a look at your your site and your art career. Um, and then next Tuesday at this same time, um, we're going to be doing another call like this where Melissa and I are going to actually turn the tables and uh, I'm going to t- share a little bit about my experience uh, in living a creative life and uh, sharing some, some specific tips on how artists and creative people can go from I don't know how to do anything online to having some immediate success uh, with selling their art and their or their creative projects online. Woohoo! Turn yeah, the tables! Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't look like we have any questions or comments at this time. 
but uh, so if there's unless there's anything else, Melissa, why don't we just go ahead and end it here and we'll make sure that if you're listening, that you get on the Art and Powers mailing list, and we'll go from there. And we will keep you posted on how to submit your website for review, and um, hopefully we'll see you all on Tuesday for our next call where I'm going to grill Corey. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, everybody, and, and have a great night, Melissa. You too. Thanks, Corey. Bye.